Right. Good morning. Welcome to the second day of All Systems Go 2024. For the first talk of the day, you'll have again me. Hello. Uh, my name is Luca. I'm a software engineer at Microsoft. I work in the Azure infrastructure. I'm also a system D maintainer. Uh, and I am uh, Zbigniew Szebolinjewski Schmeck. I go by Zbyszek. I work in Red Hat. Um, yeah. Excellent. So we are going to talk to you about the state of the system D project. We haven't done this in a while. Uh, Leonard used to do this kind of talks, but these days he only talks about TPMs. So we thought about uh, giving you an, a generic update of how we are doing. And at the end, we'll have a panel uh, with the rest of the maintainers team, core maintainers team, where you can ask us questions. But first, um, so the uh, uh, finances for a system D project are managed by SPI, and we thank them for their tireless work. Um, we send them one report every year about the status of the project. That's what I send them um, for 2023. So we had three major releases, 61 stable releases, and we merged 6,814 commits up from 2022 from a total of 368 contributors. So in general, we do two to four releases, uh, major releases a year, depending on how we feel and how broken uh, our code is. Um, and we maintain five stable branches. And right now, we have 2.56 to 2.52. Um, you want to talk about the core contributors? <laughs> Um, so the yeah, so the number of stable branches is uh, up for grabs. So if uh, somebody wants to maintain a branch for s another branch for another distribution, then they are welcome to to start contributing that. The requirement is maintaining the CI for it. That's what we yeah, have. just just well doing the work. Yeah. Um, and uh, we have people from, from Microsoft, from Red Hat, uh, uh, Meta. Meta. Yeah. Yes. So these are the co core maintainers, like the most active people, and unaffiliated uh, maintainers as well. We also have important contributions from other companies like Canonical, SUSE, and more. Uh, now, the key thing uh, we wanted to show here is that we have a healthy ecosystem, a variegated set of maintainers, and people doing this for their job, but we don't have a single point of failure. Like, if one of these companies goes bust tomorrow morning, the project won't be dead. We'll keep going because we have a healthy mix, and this keeps improving. We keep getting new contributors and new maintainers and so on. Um, final thing, oh, uh, we try to participate in Outreach uh, every year. This year we couldn't, um, but we try again next year to have an intern every summer. You want to talk about this? Uh, yeah, it seems crazy, but the number of commits keeps essentially going up. Uh, and this means that we need uh, more people because we will go crazy if we don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, we already are pretty much on the way there. but. Um, one new newish thing we did uh, in the past year or so is uh, having contractors work for us, um, which is working quite well. Um, so the first thing we did was self-funded, and we had the coding folks um, change our documentation. So if you've seen the system documentation in the past, we have 20,000 different options, verbs, commands, and it's, it was quite hard to understand when a command was added, when an option was added. We took inspiration from the Python documentation, if you've seen that, so you can both have a drop-down menu to choose the version, and every item is also tagged with a version, they introduce it. We did not go back to V1, we went back with the drop-down, like five versions, but we keep adding, and for the tags, we went back uh, 50 versions or so. Um, but it looks uh, quite nice. Um, next, we worked on the uh, integration test, uh, um, Refactoring. So this is thanks to the Sovereign Tech Fund um, finance, financing us, so thanks to STF uh, for um, choosing us. Um, again, this was done by CodeThink. There is a talk um, later about this, um, uh, so I won't go into details, but basically we switched to use MKUSI for our te integration test. But the CodeThink folks will go over it. Um, then, so again, funded by STF, there are ongoing rolling programs they have, so they hired this neighborhood company, and they're doing some nice work for us. Again, they do the stuff that would take us a lot of time to do. It's not really, you know, exciting work, but it's good to have, and it just uh, takes time. It, it is exciting work, come on. I see. <laughs> um, so, yeah, do you want to talk about this? Sphinx documentation, for example. That's exciting. <laughs> uh, so um, 
Well, we, we have documentation, lots of documentation, uh, and because it is in DocBook, it is a bit uh, hard to, to, to manage. Uh, DocBook doesn't really do indexing. Uh, and uh, we also produce HTML and um, man page, page outputs. And we are finally getting ready to switch over to using a proper system like Sphinx. Uh, I think it will be much better. I am very biased towards Sphinx. Uh, and uh, well, this means that we will need to rewrite approximately 100,000 lines of, of DocBook text into Sphinx. And we are, well, doing that in the background. So hopefully later this year we will have a, a uh, well, Sphinx-based documentation with indexing and maybe some more fancy features like um, a good display of code in uh, our HTML output. Nice, yes, looking forward to this. Uh, other things that Neighborhood did was um, my help us migrate. So we had the free desktop.org wiki, which wasn't anymore really a wiki because you couldn't edit it, um, which is the point of a wiki. Uh, so we, uh, they helped us move this to GitHub pages, so it's now all published on systemd.io. So all the non-man pages documentation we had on freedesktop.org is now migrated, which is also nice. Uh, because it's much easier to edit, you just send us a pull request. And finally, we have a security bug bounty program with, yes, we hack. Uh, no, we have tons of money there available. If you're a security researcher, if you find a security bug, in systemd, please use that platform. Uh, you know, again, this is funded by the STF, and we will literally give you money to find security bugs. There are some rules to follow, but please do um, try and use this platform if you are a security researcher or uh, such things. Um, yeah, that's it. So for CI, um, so we. I just want to give an overview. I'm not going to every details here, but we've got tons of CI running on systemd, on every PR, and on merge. Um, the, we have both build tests and unit tests, um, uh, code coverage, I think we sit at about 70 something percent. Um, and we do also integration tests because systemd is a system component, the unit tests are not enough. So the integration test suite is the most important one. Um, and the coverage there, what we, I think our main um, blind spot is non-XTC architectures, basically only on the Ubuntu cloud tests, we have ARC, um, um, ARM64, PPC64, and S390. And even that is just a non-QMU stuff, so the half the integration tests run. Everything else is pretty much only x86. Uh, we have unit tests and build tests on other architectures, but that's not enough. So if you are interested in other architectures, we'd really use help, uh, especially from companies for you know funding uh, GitHub, uh, GitHub Actions Runners, for example, um, because we, our interest is mainly in x86. And of course, I want to thank um, the Ubuntu folks, Canonical, because they let us use for free the cloud, uh, cloud auto package test, and Red Hat as well with their CentOS based um, Vagrant CI, and Packet as well, uh, they let us use their uh, package build system, um, which is also nice. Okay, so we're going to, um, we, we had these two major releases um, in the last year or so, and we're preparing a new one. So we'll give you just a quick overview. We're not going to every item because we'll be here until tomorrow morning. And even this is just the list of the things we thought were, from our point of view, the highlights. There's much more. If you look at the change log, it's huge. So um, first of all, the PCR log stuff, that's probably one of the most important one, but we're not going to the details because I had a talk yesterday, it's already online, you can look at that. So I can talk about the SD executor, um, which I did that work, um, and I learned yesterday I managed to break a second distribution, I broke Fedora, and with that I broke also Tizen, I'm very happy and looking for a third one, uh, for a hat trick, but basically this means that uh, we used to uh, start services by forking from PID1 and then doing a, a lot of setup and then doing the exec at the end. That's problematic for many reasons. In my case, it was problematic because we have this copy and write situation where your forked process takes the entire memory address space of PID1 and duplicates it and it's copy and write, so PID1 continues, touches stuff, 
this one continues the other way, it touches stuff, so you get double the memory footprint. And if you have like memory max set on your CPU for your service, we had that, and then later on we crash before even starting the service because we hit the memory limit. Not nice. So now we have a separate binary, so PID1 forks with PID uh, FD spawn, so we fork and immediately execute another binary, and we serialize via IPC the settings, and then this binary will have its own under space, completely separate, it's a new binary, so after exec everything is cleared, so we don't have this copy and write trap, all these issues, and uh, we use clone three, so we can do clone into, so we clone directly into the new C group. Um, second thing we are doing, PIDFDs, so I did a longer talk about this stuff at LPC, um, if you are interested, but basically, PID uh, file descriptors allow you to track processes without worrying about reuse because the PIDs um, uh, overflow and uh, wrap around. And we, I uh, think mostly Leonard and other people as well, have changed, I think at this point, most of the internals to track processes via PIDFD. Um, it's an ongoing process, right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, Yukify is a, a tiny tool to, to build Yukis, and Yukis are getting more important. Uh, so, uh, well, I mean, it's it has become a thing really over the last year, and um, new, new small new features are being added, like inspection and uh, better signing options. Um, we uh, for service sandboxing, we got uh, better uh, firewalling. Um, System decrypt and roll is another thing that is under constant development. Uh, so uh, offline sealing, I, I'm glad. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So that's quite cool as well. Now. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, uh, sorry. So oh, they, we, we talked about contractors and oh, yes. Altrichi. So VM spawn was done by contract over contract work. A cool thing. Uh, and uh, Blue Screen of Death uh, was done by Outreach. Yes. So we were there first. The kernel people copied us, you copycats. But we had the idea first um, last year. Um, okay. I think we'll move on to 256. This is the latest release. Um, so C Group V1 is going to die. If you are still relying on C Group V1 now, it's 2024. It's time to let go. Um, if you still need that stuff, there are LTS releases. There's CentOS, there's RHEL, there's Debian, there's Ubuntu LTS. They maintain them for 10 years. Do not move to the latest system D if you want C group V1. So in 256, we now fail the boot if you are configured into the legacy C group V1 hierarchy. You have to pass a specific parameter on the command line to say, yes, I really want to use this stuff and then we let you boot. This will go away next year. If you have workload on C group V1, please move on. Um, all the things we know about, Podman, Docker, whatever else, they all work fine on C group V2. If you have old workloads, please move to LTS releases and stay there. Don't use new system D stuff. Um, the other thing we've done quite a lot um, is uh, make our big dependent, sorry, our runtime dependencies optional um, via DL open. So, you might have heard about this little XZ um, story from some months ago. Um, so this, this, we did not do this work because of that. We had actually had started before that. In fact, we think that uh, Matteo was doing the work on uh, making XZ an optional library. We think that's one of the, we will never know, but it's one of the things that triggers the peop, trigger these people to hurry up. Uh, but basically we are making all these uh, uh, libraries an optional dependency. So they are used, they are loaded, only when you ask for a feature that uses them. In the libsystemd, for example, if you use, try to open a journal that is compressed, then we load the uncompression library, but not if you use, for example, SD Notify. Um, and we do this not just for libsystemd, but across the, the system. Uh, I think right now, in the next version, libsystemd will only dynamically link against libc and libcap, and we are trying to remove also libcap. We haven't got there yet. Um, and that's it. So libsystemd will have no other dynamic dependencies linked in. It will DL open some if there are. And because this um, makes discovery of these optional dependencies hard, we came up with a way to um, add, um, to note this, uh, the list of optional dependencies we use via a new elf section. And it's on the website. And we have also have tools for RPM, for Deb, 
to automatically discover and generate dependencies from these optional dependencies. Um, other thing, um, Leonard worked on this uh, NS resource D and mount FSD services. Basically, what these are for is to uh, give unprivileged, unprivileged processes um, namespaced uh, file descriptors pre-prepared with a UID mapped and um, images already mounted in a new mount namespace. Uh, this is guarded by Polkit, for example, so it can be either interactive or with a fixed policy. Um, and also, um, if you have a DM Verity image, then uh, that is uh, with the signature enforced by the kernel, then that is also allowed because security is guaranteed by that. And this is a way to allow unprivileged processes to securely get these user and mounting spaces with the images created um, without requiring root themselves via IPC and Wiring. Uh, for example, we use it for unprivileged end spawn. Uh, finally, for my list, um, Leonard added capsules. Now, this is a way to basically group services together. Um, like, you know, the, in systemd, we have the PID1, the system manager, and we have for each user session a systemd instance that runs as the user, as a user manager. You have different sets of units. This allows you to create an arbitrary and other instance with a dynamic user, so an ephemeral UID, uh, and you group things together. I really wanted to call this workgroups, so we could have done systemd for workgroups release. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't work out. It's called capsules, and yeah. That's um, so another thing is that that has been like growing slowly is uh, support for AFVSOC. So networking with a VM without networking, and this opens the door for, well, getting information out of the VM and connecting to the VM even before it's really up. Um, well, without, before the network is up. So we we have. Uh, Exfiltration of information uh, out of the VM, and uh, the, man the manager at various levels will send information up to the higher level. So, out, I mean, from the user manager up, and from from capsules up, and from the VM outside, and then you can, well, for example, uh, wait for the VM to to reach a certain level reliably and uh, act from it, act on that from the outside. Uh, and there's also SSH integration. Uh, SSH also got integration with HomeD, so it's easier to connect to a, uh, as a user to a user using HomeD for their home directory. Um, and also for SSH in via VSOC, so you do no longer need a, f a, a working network inside your VM to SSH. Where you just SSH over VSOC, so it just works. No need for cloud init or that stuff. It's kind of neat. Uh, another uh, little tool that was added and uh, protocol is the VPIC protocol. So uh, a specific format of files in a directory and then, then VPIC will pick the right one. So you can just drop in files and then the update system will know what is the latest file in kind of a reliable way and can act in a proper way on that. Uh, and uh, mm, Run zero, which is a uh, sudo like uh, sudo copy uh, done over uh, systemd uh, jobs. Yeah. So th the point of the run zero is that it does not need set UID. So we start a unit uh, via IPC by systemd, so that we can build systems without set UID binaries, which is kind of nice. Okay. Uh, so um, it's still September, so it's still possible that uh, we will release uh, RC1, <laughs> uh, depending on travel. Uh, <laughs> uh, NPRs get emerged. Yes. Uh, so um, we have been, uh, well, uh, again, uh, a lot of this work was done by Leonard. So we will expose uh, JSON and Varlink uh, in libsystemd. Uh, JSON is needed for Varling, so that, but uh, and Varling is the cool new protocol that can be used instead of Dbus in various circumstances. Um, and there's a talk by Leonard on Varling uh, after the next one, I believe. Uh, we are uh, uh, adding uh, support for you know secure attention key. Uh, th it, like the support in LogInd is easy. The question whether the desktop will pick this up, possibly. Um, 
And uh, another thing that has been improving over time is system D repart, and we had 23 talks about MKSI uh, yesterday, a few today. Because it's good. Uh, so basically, the, the, the question, the, the, the uh, repart, we want repart to be invoked uh, offline and do all the things that it can do without privileges, and this, this capability has been growing. Yeah. And so one thing, another thing I'm trying to break is inhibitors. So there is this framework that we have uh, in LogInd where um, processes can take what we call inhibitor locks, either blocking or delaying. And these are supposed to be taken when you want the shutdown uh, or reboot to be held back for either indefinitely or for some time. Um, the problem is that it was the conditions under this were respected or not were quite unclear as to users. And we had a lot of issues with this. So now we have re-architected this. So inhibitors are always respected, even by root. So even if you are root and you try to reboot, um, and there's an inhibitor lock, the systemd APIs will reject it. We tell you there's an inhibitor lock by this process. So of course, you are root, you can kill that process, and you can still reboot. But this is uh, to ensure that it doesn't happen by mistake, that you have some things running, like a firmware updater. You don't want to kill that uh, while it's in the middle of uh, flashing your firmware, um, for example. So this has been reworked. It's uh, pretty much not compatible anymore with how it worked before. So it's a kind of incompatible change. But on balance, we think it's going in the right direction, and it, it will work uh, as people intuitively expect them to work. There are compatibility flags to go back to the previous mode in case you need that. And uh, yeah, this will probably break some stuff. <laughs> we'll see. Um, the other important thing, uh, this was work on by Leonard after lots of discussions, um, but we managed to find an agreement. and. We will have multi-profile UKIs, so this means that you, in a single UKI, you can embed multiple command lines, multiple unit RDs, uh, multiple DTBs, and then as the boot, we'll show you um, a, a chooser, and then you can pick which one to use when you boot the system. For example, this is you know this is how grub worked, right? You have the normal entry and the debug entry, the standard stuff. And this is uh, targeted at exactly those kind of use cases. You can have your normal kernel command line and your debug equal one kernel command line, for example. And uh, yeah, this will be available in the next version. Um, and I think we can move on. Yeah, I think we're almost done. Yeah, right? we're almost done. Out of time, we have two minutes. So maybe, yeah. Oh. So maybe, maybe uh, I want to mention two things. Um, so. JSON output, uh, it's, it's growing and it will make things easier. Uh, so if there is some particular tool that doesn't support JSON and you want uh, it to support JSON, well, file a pull request or, uh, or talk to us. Maybe we can make it happen faster. Um, pretty cool is the general CTL invocation thing. It's uh, Finally, we'll solve the issue, hopefully, with a little bit more tooling, that uh, you, you run a service, you start it five times, and it crashes five times, and then you look at the logs, and figuring out which crash was which is kind of hard. Now we can make it happen. Uh, and yesterday, I added an item to the do, to the to-do list to have system CTL output the output for last invocation. I think this will be a nice improvement. Yeah, that's very nice for usability. All right, so yes, we are pretty much out of time. So next, we are going to have the roundtable with the maintainer. 